Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this talk, which has been uh, done in collaboration with uh, Christophe Texier in Orsay and uh, Pierre Delplace with my students. So, um, the motivation comes back to this problem of uh, persistent current. And um, so, as we have seen this morning from uh, Joe Imri's uh, talk, this uh, persistent current is a very simple quantity. It's a derivative, the sensitivity of the uh, energy or free energy uh, with respect to the magnetic uh, flux. And it's a property of uh, this uh, isolated ring. Now the question is, what is the sensitivity? What is the dependence of energy uh, with respect to flux? And to have a finite uh, result, actually, you need the quantum mechanics. So what you need is to have your system, the perimeter, to be smaller than some phase current length below which you can do quantum mechanics. Moreover, most of the time, we'll, uh, uh, these rings are metallic rings, or even uh, semiconducting rings, but they are disordered. So the length is larger than some elastic mean free pass, which means that we are dealing with some intermediate regime, mesoscopic regime, in which we can do quantum mechanics, but in which we have disorder. So we have to deal with disorder and do some quantum <laughs> mechanics of a disorder system. Uh, so, uh, my interest was to see uh, what happens to this persistent current, which actually is not really a property of the isolated ring. Uh, you still have a persistent current if you connect rings, but now the question is what happens to this persistent current? Uh, uh, of course, the answer to this question amounts to understand how the loops, you know, the current loops conspire between different rings, okay? And uh, basically, the physics of persistent current goes continuously from this isolated ring to uh, actually a two-dimensional uh, magnetism of uh, two-dimensional uh, metals. So basically, in between, we have the same physics, but of course, we have a different structure of the diffusive trajectories. So the point that I want to address is what can we say about the Aronov-Bohm flux dependence of persistent current and also of other mes mesoscopic uh, quantities when we change the geometry of these networks. Okay? So the outline is the following. I want to see how these mesoscopic quantities, which I'm going to introduce, evolve from this geometry, this geometry, or, you, you know, for example, these two geometries where the rings are close to each other or far from each other. So in, uh, in order to answer this question, since we are dealing with disordered system, uh, I will relate this physical quantities to the solution of a diffusion equation. And the question is how to solve this diffusion equation on any network with any arnov bohm fluxes in the different rings. Okay? This will give us a solution about physical quantities and also some information about the winding properties around these different loops. And the tool that I'm going to use to answer these uh, questions is what is called the spectral determinant, which, is, uh, which contains the, the, the basic information about diffusion in these uh, different geometries. So first, let me remind you very briefly that uh, different mesoscopic quantities are all related to a single quantity, which is this P of T here, which is a probability to return to the origin for a diffusive particle. Okay? So Joe Imri told us this morning that the persistent current depends on some parameter which depends on the interaction, which may be modulated by magnetic impurities and so on. And it depends also on this return probability, like other mesoscopic quantities. So persistent current is an equilibrium property, but other out of equilibrium properties like conductivity, uh, weak localization correction, for example, and I will talk about this quantity, which actually is the simplest one, we have seen from Sasha Mirlin's talk that the weak localization correction is a correction to classical transport in which you have the, 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 the conductance is the probability to uh, cross the system from one end to another. And to this classical probability, you have, may have correction which uh, amount to a couple, one trajectory and the time reverse tra trajectory. So of course, this correction are related to the statistics, the distribution of these trajectories, which is nothing but the return probability in a diffusive system. And we'll see that this return probability is modulated by the magnetic flux. This is a phase sensitive quantity. So it has to be cut at some 
time scale. And this time scale is a phase current time, which is limited by uh, uh, interaction with external degrees of freedom, phonons, magnetic impurities, or other electrons themselves. And here, it, for me, is just a parameter. So the, what you have to, to remember from these uh, quantities here is that all quantities are encoded in this time integral of the return probability, so the Laplace transform of the return probability. And this gamma, the Laplace parameter, is just the inverse of the phase current time. So basically, what I would like to do, OK, so for example, the weak localization correction is nothing but the Laplace transform of the return probability. And most of all, I am concerned with the harmonic dependence, the harmonic of the flux dependence of this quantity. So I am interested uh, in the Laplace transform and Fourier transform of the time dependent return probability. So what is this return probability? So it's a solution of the diffusion equation, but we know that diffusion equation is a classical equation because, of course, the probability to diffuse in the system is a classical quantity because basically a probability is a sum of intensities. It's an intensity. But you know that we have seen from previous talks that it has a quantum interference component because you can pair uh, um, time reverse trajectories. And these time reverse trajectories, if you have a loop, they accumulate opposite Aronov Bohm fluxes. Okay? So that's why this component here to the return probability, which in zero flux double the return probability, this component here oscillates with the flux, but with a period H over 2e instead of h over e, and this will be the case for any uh, disordered uh, average quantity which can be described with the diffusion equation. So this quantity is solution of the diffusion equation, but with an effective charge, which is 2e. So now we want to solve this diffusion equation, so I start with a very simple uh, example, the case of the isolated ring. We know this return probability, you know this is the uh, uh, probability to wind n times around the loop after time t, it's a Gaussian process. So the Laplace transform is this uh, celebrated Alshuler, Aronoff, and Spivak <coughs> uh, dependence for the weak localization correction. And now the question that I want to ask is what can we say for the same quantity in all these geometries? Okay, now how can, are we going to describe this time integrated? return probability. So the point is to solve diffusion equation on these networks and to get the useful information. And the useful information is actually encoded in one quantity, which I call the spectral determinant. Uh, you can, so as I said, the physical quantities are the time integrated return probability. So this return probability can be written as a sum of exponentials, where he, here the uh, EI are nothing but the eigenvalues of the diffusion equation. For example, in free space, it's just dq squared. Okay? So the Laplace transform of this quantity is the sum of the inverse of the eigenvalues, and the sum of the inverse is a logarithmic derivative of a product. Okay? So this product here is a product of the eigenvalues, so it's called a spectral determinant. And it turns out that on a network, this quantity here is quite easy to calculate. The spectral determinant on the network, if I consider any network made of n nodes, and nb bonds, but let's say n nodes, all the information, the useful information, is encoded in a n by n matrix whose diagonal elements are basically the lengths of the bonds connected to a given node, and the off-diagonal terms relate one node to another, and they contain the Aronov-Bohm phase. Okay. So from this matrix, actually from the determinant of this matrix, uh, the determinant of this matrix is nothing but this spectral determinant from which I can get all physical quantities. So if you give me a given network, if you give me the lengths, the Aronov-Bohm fluxes and so on, the phase current lengths, we can get immediately these physical quantities. And this matrix here, uh, maybe some people know that it has the same structure that the matrix which was introduced to describe uh, critical temperature of superconducting networks by Alexander and Dejen. In that case, uh, 
the, quant the, 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 the equation that you had to solve was Ginzburg-Landau equation. Uh, you can do the same also if you want to solve Schrodinger equation on a graph, which is also a uh, second order differential equation. Uh, all these uh, equations have obviously the same uh, structure. So how do we get this structure here? Nothing but solving diffusion equation on each bond, you know, and right current conservation at the nodes. So now once we have this spectral determinant, we can, by the logarithmic derivative, get the flux dependent time integrated return probability after a time tau phi, one over gamma. By Laplace, inverse Laplace transform, we know the time dependent flux dependent return probability. And by Fourier transform, we know here the, uh, Laplace transform, the, the Fourier transform, which is directly related to physical quantities like weak localization or persistent current. And if we want to get some information about more, let's say, mathematical structure, we may be interested in the structure of the winding properties around the different loops. So now what I'm going to do uh, is to show you a few uh, simple examples. The first example is that uh, starting with this uh, spectral determinant, uh, I want to compare the, let's say, the persistent current or the weak localization correction or any of these mesoscopic quantities, compare what we have for the isolated ring and for connected rings. I can do it in a very simple, uh, in a simple limit here. I just restrict myself to this limit. From the expansion of the logarithm of this spectral determinant, we find that when we connect the ring to some uh, um, wire, or if you connect the ring to each other, there is a reduction by a factor which is just a geometrical factor, which is the product of the 2 over z, where z is a, a coordination number of all these uh, nodes. Okay? So uh, I'm not talking about the absolute value of the persistent current, but if I know the value of the persistent current for a given, for the isolated loop, I can deduce the relative values in different uh, networks. Okay? So they are simple geometric factors. And for example, the message is that for connected structure here, 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 you have a persistent current for connected rings. And actually, this was observed uh, in a few years ago, where these uh, people here, Samina Dayar and co-workers, uh, measured the persistent current of this chain of rings, and they found a finite persistent current, which is only slightly reduced compared to the uh, persistent current of isolated uh, rings. So now I want to show you a few examples to show you how it works, how from the spectral determinant we get <coughs> the physical quantity. So I start with the isolated ring. The spectral determinant, as we have seen before, here I have my n by n matrix as just dimension one. So it depends on the length of the cutoff, the phase current length, and of course of the uh, dimensionless uh, flux. And from the, spectral, from the logarithmic derivative, I get the weak localization correction and the harmonics of this weak localization correction, which are the Alshuler Aronoff and Spivak uh, oscillation. Now we can modify first exercise is to connect is to connect the ring to arms. And now the structure is still simple. So this is the expression here. Oh, sorry. So this is still the expression. And it has the same structure, actually, as for the isolated ring, except that here you have some effective length, which depends on the bare length and on L5. So then we can consider different regime. Regime where L5 is small, which means that the ring is weakly uh, current. So in this case, we can get, we find the reduction of this uh, weak localization by uh, the, the factor two-thirds that I uh, show you previously. And maybe more interesting is the limit where L phi is much larger than L, which means that uh, you stay current on many windings. You know, the, the, the ring is completely current, so the electron has time to, 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 to wind along the ring many times. And in this case, the result that we find is that instead of having an exponential decay 
with the, the perimeter of the ring, we have a decay with the square, the square root of the perimeter of the ring. You know, here this result is quite natural, I would say. This means that you can wind a number which is L phi over L. Okay? And here you can find, you can wind a, a number which is L phi square over L. So which means that the, the time dependence of this return probability has been modified. So to understand this, we can now uh, <clears throat> inverse Laplace transform. So the case of the isolated ring, as I said before, is quite known. We have this Gaussian accumulation of winding number, and the typical winding number scales diffusively like the square root of time. But now when you have the connection to the uh, arms here, which has to, to be supposed very long, so you have this new dependence here. So if I inverse Laplace transform, this means that in time representation, I'm considering very long time, time which are much longer than the Thaulest time, which is the typical time to wind once around the ring. So I am considering very long trajectories. And you see that in this case, the uh, probability is not Gaussian anymore. And the winding, the typical winding number uh, varies very slowly with time because most of the time the, the electrons are, are going to spend their time in the, in the arms. So the diffusion around the along the ring is now subdiffusive. Okay. So, and of course, these uh, different time dependence here are related to this different uh, length dependence of the exponential. Now, we can, uh, let me come back here. Of course, this problem here uh, is the same as this problem here where we would have very long uh, arms between the attached uh, ring. And now we may ask the opposite question. What happens if the ring are very close to each other? If we are in this situation. Now the electron is going to wind in one ring and then it goes to the other one and it always accumulates out of bone flux. Okay, so now the distribution of winding is different from the previous case. So same recipe, we calculate the spectral determinant, which I <coughs> do not detail here logarithmic derivative, and we get this uh, one Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform, and you see that this uh, quantity here now depends exponentially like n or L over L phi, which means that, again, we have a Gaussian accumulation of flux, which means that the typical winding number scales like square root of time, and actually this function is about the same as for the diffusion on a cylinder. It's about the same, but here you have factor two, eight instead of four. And it's, actually this factor two is quite uh, easy to understand because you may describe this uh, array of rings, you can fold them, okay, like pancakes. And if you fold them like pancakes, you make a cylinder, but the rings are attached on alternative uh, sides, okay? So you can draw this picture here. You can think of this array of rings like uh, folded rings which are attached on only one side, while on the cylinder, the rings are attached on both sides, okay? So this is the origin of this uh, factor two. <clears throat> so uh, last exercise, now the case of the square uh, lattice. Now, the calculation of the spectral determinant, uh, as I said, it's an eigenvalue problem, and we know that the eigenvalue problem for the square lattice in the magnetic field is the off shatter spectrum, so you have to find the eigenvalues of the equa diffusion equation, which are the eigenvalues of the off which are the off shatter spectrum. And actually, the structure of uh, the off shatter spectrum is quite uh, complex, but the quantity of interest, which is the sum of the inverse of eigenvalues, it's actually a boring function, actually, it's a continuous uh, function, so we can calculate this uh, numerically, okay, so we get the oscillations of weak localization correction, for example, and from uh, inverse Laplace transform, uh, we should be able to get the time dependence of, um, of, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, of return probability. 
Uh, actually, it's uh, not easy to do it in this way. Uh, here we have done the opposite because we know the large time behavior because for very long time you can forget the, the discrete character of the lattice. You can consider that you have a two-dimensional system and we know that for a large time this probability is given by Levy's law, probability of two-dimensional uh, diffusion uh, <coughs> on the plane. And uh, from this Levy law, uh, by Laplace transform, we can get this dependence here. So on the next uh, slide, what I am going to show you uh, is this uh, um, the, the, Fourier, uh, the Fourier component of this flux dependence, which are indeed well described by this uh, scaling function here. So these are the Fourier components here. And if I scale n p n as a function of L phi divided by square root of n, I get this universal behavior. So to uh, conclude, uh, we, we have a, uh, draw a kind of a dictionary of different, uh, for different uh, uh, networks where we have calculated the um, Fourier uh, decomposition of the time uh, dependence of the return probability. And from this Laplace transform, we get physical quantities, for example, weak localization correction or persistent current. And actually, if we consider all these geometries, these quantities are characterized by two uh, numbers. One is alpha, which tells me how uh, I uh, wind around the loop. Okay? So is it diffusive, sub-diffusive, or, or, or more than diffusive? And D is the dimension of the, uh, of the space which is attached to the loop. Okay? So we have this different uh, situation here. So we have kind of universal uh, behavior. Right? This function here, we, we have calculated them for this different, uh, <coughs> these different networks. Uh, to conclude, I would say that the most, uh, maybe the most uh, uh, spectacular difference is between this case and this case. So if you consider this uh, linear chain of ring or this linear chain of attached ring, so from I told you here, the um, uh, dependence of, let's say, weak localization correction with the length, here it is a Bessel function, it's an exponential decay of n L over L phi, while here it's an exponential decay of the square root. So for a given L dependence of L phi as a function of temperature, uh, we expect uh, for these two cases different uh, manifestation of this different winding uh, should be a different uh, temperature dependence of the physical quantities. And I think that I have to stop here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> One question? Oh, okay. You had this uh, table of values of alpha. Is there a way to uh, engineer a network that will have a desired alpha? Uh, maybe we had no time yet to play with, uh, with, uh, with this, so we just play with a few cases, okay? Uh, uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, of course, then you can think about uh, self-similar networks and things like this. Yeah, probably uh, networks which, in which you have, uh, let's say, fractal uh, dimensions for, uh, for diffusion. Thank you very much, Philippe.